Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Parkscope Unprofessional Podcast Hour. We are now living in a post-Pokemon Go world. Uh, everything has changed. Cats and dogs are getting along with in uh, together. I see people walking around parks with phones out. It's actually kind of interesting. I was at uh, getting my hair cut, and there are just people walking around with their phones out, going to pokey stops and stuff. It's nuts. So, yes, welcome to our uh, new Pikachu overlords, everyone. Uh, also joining me today on this very special uh, Saturday afternoon edition of the podcast is uh, Guillaume from La Parcarama. Guillaume, how are you doing? Hi there. I'm good. How are you? I'm hanging in there. It's, uh, it's a nice day out. It's kind of sunny. I'm looking out my window, seeing people Actually, bike. I've been trying to play Pokemon for the whole day and the servers crashed for like the entire world. Oh, yeah. So it's been a very sad afternoon to me. Yeah, there. <laughs> I don't know why they launched the game in 26 new countries on a Saturday. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a smart idea, because <laughs> like every no, not really. everyone wants to play it now. So maybe do it like on a random weekday next time, guys. I don't know, <laughs> but um, yeah. So let's get into this real quick. Um, All right. Yeah, well, this is going to be a discussion of your trip to Shanghai Disneyland and also kind of a little bit about, you know, the, the website and kind of your views on things. Right. So uh, how did you kind of get uh, become a, th- a fan of theme parks? Well, uh, when I was a kid, I lived like, well, I live in Brussels, in mm-hmm. the heart of Europe, in Belgium. And we have this local theme park, uh, which is called Walibi. And I used to live like five blocks away from this theme park. So we used to drive a lot in front of the theme park. Yeah. And I think I was obsessed with theme parks even before I did my first steps into a theme park. So, uh, yeah, it's, it got me interested and fascinated with theme parks uh, as a very young age. Mm-hmm. And then when I was a teenager, I started to go uh, on the forums, French-speaking forums about theme parks. Uh, I met a lot of nice people, and then we used to have like road trips to uh, first Belgium, and then the Netherlands, and then Germany with Europa Park and Fantasyland. And we're very lucky because when you live in like me in the very heart of Europe, you live like on the best place if you're a theme park nerd because there are like so many great theme parks that are like uh, less than a three-hour drive from my home. I'm living like. One hour and a half from Disney in Paris with the bullet train. Uh, one hour and a half from the Efteling in the Netherlands. And same with Fantasyland. And then if we drive a little further, we have Europa Park. So it's like the best place to live. Yeah, I want to do uh, one, I want to do a European trip sometime and just hit up <laughs> Efteling and Europa and Disneyland Paris and all that stuff. So that that's that's awesome. That's yeah, that that's awesome. I've always been kind of jealous because uh, when I was on the um, forums like in the early 2000s and just looking at all the different uh, Europe parks and uh, what's um, there's a one Europe park I forget what park it is I want to say it's Europa but it has like the awesome uh, mega intimate coaster do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, that should be the um, Holiday Park with the Expedition G-Force? Yes, yes, that's exactly Expedition yeah. G-Force oh, with Holiday yeah. Park It's really good Nice. And didn't they uh, do VR last year on that? Or am I imagining that this? Whoa, uh, I'm not sure about Expedition G4, but mm-hmm. I know that a lot of local theme parks in Europe and in the US as well are now adding like a layer of VR on yeah. the aging coasters, which yeah. is not a bad idea, but I'm very, I don't know, VRs and coaster, I think it's sort of a novelty. Mm-hmm. I think so too. Like, at Cedar Point, which is my park, <laughs> is yeah. um yeah I know it's a, it's a pretty good one to have as your local it park. <laughs> they have um an Intamin suspended uh, coaster called Iron Dragon, mm. and uh, they just are doing a test run this year on uh, VR. So it's running for like a month. So like from the hours of like five p.m. to close, you can get a reservation to do this experience. As opposed to like just standing in line and waiting for it, so it's like almost like a fast oh, pass nice. thing. So like you sign up for a time, you show up, and then they let you do that. So I want to try that out when I go in a few weeks. That'd but, be pretty uh, the, cool. The, the time frame seems very short. It's like a, just at the end of the day. Yeah, just at the end of the day, and it's just for a month. 
So okay. it's really weird. I don't. It's like okay, that's that's odd. So like instead of people running to like get on Millennium Force or Dragster or yeah. Maverick or Valoran or Gatekeeper, they're all just going to run and try to put their name on this waiting list <laughs> for a VR experience. Okay. But another. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah, and another thing was they had a old coaster there called Disaster Transport, which was this weird it would it, it's a bobsled coaster you know like okay. an intimate bobsled but what they did was the like the guy dick kinzel um went to disney world and he rode space mountain and star tours and loved both of them so what they did was they enclosed disaster they enclosed this avalanche i think it was called avalanche run they enclosed it and turned it into disaster transport and they added audio animatronics and this whole entire le- level of theming and then they promptly forgot about it after the first year <laughs> like there was actually like people spieling in the queue and there was like a pre-show and then they just kind of got rid of all of it like in a year and what they did was they handed out these you know those little polarized glasses they give you and you can look at fireworks and they like oh, right, yeah. they just did that with disaster transport they just gave them to you on the ride like when the ride kind of was falling apart and it would like turn the lights into like stars so I that's how I kind of view VR right now it's kind of okay. like Here's your polarized glasses. <laughs> All yeah. the lights look like stars now. <laughs> so I think like VR coasters maybe like a nice addition for seasonal events like Halloween season or something. Like oh that. yeah, but because of operational uh, side of it, I'm not sure it's gonna be like a last uh, long lasting uh, addition to theme park. For normal operating theme parks. Anyway. Yeah, I was. Um, listen, we'll get we'll get back on topic. But I like talking about VR and coasters. Right. But um, yeah, we'll get back on topic in a second, everyone. Um, my thing was I was listening. Um, I was reading about uh, Six Flags do, is doing their um, VR ex- experiments right now on several of their coasters, and the problem they're having is that capacity has just collapsed <laughs> like they're dispatching a train every five minutes now or something whoa it's terrible Fine. because what happened was like you have one person cleaning these goggles and they have to get everyone installed and then they realize someone didn't put it on so they have to release the restraints again so they can put them on and they put the restraints down again it's just it seems like a nightmare right now so i do think <laughs> um something like where you sign up or it's a seasonal event, I think could work pretty well. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, also, there's a park in Europe. I want to, s- I forget what it is. I think it's Thorpe that's doing like a VR experience with a magician, if I'm not mistaken, or a, ma- a illusionist. Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? UK. Yeah, but I'm not sure. Is it like a VR? It, yeah, sure. it's, I, really I think it's it. um, Darren Brown or something like that, right? Yeah, right. Absolutely, and yeah. I was actually just reading about it. It was on Engadget. Um, they did a review of it. And what it is, um, is they have, it's, you walk through and it's like this weird thing about, you know, there's kind of like zombies because of course zombies and they somehow tie it into fracking for some odd mm-hmm. reason. Go figure. But <laughs> like you board a train and the train, um, and and it's like an, it looks like a normal tube train and you put the VR goggles on but the train is like there's like a mirror that splits the train like the it's a full train on the inside but on the outside there's like a mirror that splits okay. the train so it looks like one version of it on one side and then when you exit on the other side it looks like another version does that make sense okay and and like bo- so. <laughs> both sides are themed so it looks like you've actually traveled and the VR experience, like, you put on and there's, like, people, like, there's actors who walk around and you see them and, like, there's zombies who come into the vehicle and, like, they have cast members who, like, brush your leg and stuff. Like, the zombie walks by. Nice. Yeah. And then you... Um, it seems cool. Yeah, it seems really cool. And then, like, there's a, a, a small uh, haunted house element and then you go into another VR experience uh, similar to that. So it's, it's really interesting <laughs> and it sounds bizarre. It yeah. Yeah, I'm very curious about the future of this technology, actually. Yeah. I think um, the future is not going to be VR. I bet it's going to be augmented reality. Um, I think so, too, yeah. Yeah, because an example being, um, well, we all know that like pretty much Mario Kart's coming to Universal. I mean, that's a pretty much like a the worst-kept secret in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but I, I, when I think about that, I think, hey, what happens if they extended you know, the Radiator Springs or Test Track um, windshield up higher? And you actually got to see, like, augmented reality on that, and you see, like, 
shooting out blue shells and, you know, the characters in front of you, that kind of thing combined with the live sets. Yeah. So I, I think that's what, really cool. Yeah, I mean, what, what's the point of going to an actual place, nicely themed, if you have to put, like, goggles that will completely cover your view of all these amazing and very pricey environment you know? <laughs> yes exactly because you could just put the goggles on and you could just be walking around a warehouse <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah t- definitely yeah okay anyway back on the topic uh you mentioned disneyland paris is one of your uh disney is your local disney park um something we talked about yeah something we talked about in the pre-show a little bit was just kind of like um what your thoughts are on disneyland paris and how it kind of is different from the other resorts that you've traveled to the other disney resorts and then we can kind of segue into disney uh shanghai disneyland okay well i had i had the chance to travel a lot these day uh, these these, uh, past years and um it was really interesting to discover first the U.S. Disney parks, which were the first Disney parks that I've experienced uh, after all these years visiting Disney in Paris. And it's really in- it was really interesting because um, when you are a local to uh, the uh, when you visit a lot of your local theme park, you take for granted that all the the, um, the outlets for the, from the same company will deliver the same quality standard and actually it's very it's not true for Disney Disney parks um, and all these years I've been used to Disney in Paris and then I discovered the uh, US Disney parks so it was first Disney World and I was really really amazed by the customer service the friendliness of the cast members the cleanliness of the park and more importantly the operation uh, of the rides, which is which has become very very messy in Disney and Paris. I know they are fixing it right now. They have like for these two years uh, now in Disney and Paris, there there are a lot of um, ride reha- uh, refurbishment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm I'm really curious uh, to discover it's is it going to change something to the operational mess that it's, that it's been in Paris for like the. 10, 5, maybe 5 last years. I don't know. I'm very curious. But the standard is very different. And it was the same for the Asian parks. So uh, as, as uh, for now, the only Disney resort that I, haven't, that I haven't visited is the Tokyo, which is very high on my bucket list, uh, of course. Your white but, whale. Um, absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... I, I don't want to sound like a the downer because I'm I'm feeling so lucky to have like this beautiful Disney parks Disney in Paris right in, like in my background in my uh, my backyard uh, because overall it must be like still to this day Disney in Paris the most beautiful castle park I've ever visited mm-hmm. the environment is still mind blowing yeah. And and that's sort of why I also wanted you on the show because I know there's several people who I'm friends with and also have um, had on the show who have been uh, to D- Shanghai Disneyland, uh, including Tom Bricker. But what I wanted, uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted you on the show is because well, you haven't been on the show yet, so it's always good to get a new voice. Yay. And yeah. and also, um, I would say I would say that the last uh, that Disneyland Paris is really the last um, Castle Park that's been really. Uh, revolutionized since bef- before Shanghai Disneyland came around. Absolutely, um, and, and I, I kind of want to get that perspective from you. It's interesting because last year I had the chance to visit Hong Kong Disneyland, and despite the fact that it's been open since two thousand and five or something like that, uh, it really feels like overall Disneyland Paris is like even more contemporary than Hong Kong Disneyland. Mm-hmm. You know, just for the overall scenery and um, the, um, you know, the rides in Hong Kong Disneyland are um, like the old Space Mountain that you guys have in the U.S. It's the exact, it's an exact copy from the uh, from Disneyland uh, one. Yeah. Think. Yes, absolutely. So it was very, very strange because uh, when I visited Shanghai Disneyland uh, like two weeks ago, I was like, man, this is like the first time they built a truly contemporary park since Disney in Paris. Mm-hmm. Very strange. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I, you could throw in uh, maybe Animal Kingdom up there, but like I don't think they've built a fully fledged, like fully um, fleshed out theme park since mm -hmm. Disneyland Paris. I mean, Anim yeah. Animal Kingdom opened and it was opened in phases and it didn't have Beastly Kingdom and there's like three rides there and we all know how um we all know how uh, California Adventure was and Disney Studios Paris and Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I, I won't tell me about it. Yeah, I won't bring that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're having <Thank> you. <laughs> PTSD. Um and then Hong Kong Disneyland, which I mean is nice but also opened with like a lack of attractions. I mean, the cla yeah. the classic mid 2000s Disney like like just the absolute arrogance of Disney is like them putting the tiki tiki statues that shoot water at you as an attraction on that yeah, map. Actually, oh my god, yes, <laughs> and they do that a lot in Hong Kong. But in uh, in Shanghai, you can really feel the ambition uh, that Disney has from for for, for this market, mm -hmm. and it really I really feel the same about the ambition they had when they built Disney in Paris. There yeah, a lot of similarities. Like the the level of, of execution is on par with the the one that you have in Disney in Paris or Animal Kingdom in the nicest areas. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the whole park that is um, that has the same amount of details because I think that Tomorrowland in Shanghai has it calls from for less details than um, the Adventure Isle that there is in Shanghai Disneyland. Mm -hmm. But both are very, you can really feel the ambition every, every, everywhere in the park. Yeah, and that, that's something I picked up in your review. And there's a few surprises in, in the review, especially since it seems like they went real heavy in Adventure Isle and the um, Treasure Cove. I feel like that's where they invested a lot of that money in. Well, I must say that these are the um, parts of the park that I like the most. So mm -hmm. maybe I covered <laughs> this one a bit more. Yeah. Um, the um, the Fantasyland is really beautiful as well, but I I'm, I'm, I'm not really a fan of like the Alice in Wonderland, uh, the Timberton movie, and the overall yeah. execution uh, and the overall direction of this movie. And well, for the rest, there are like two attractions I think in shanghai disneyland's fantasy land that are truly new because the seven dwarfs mine train the winnie the pooh attraction the teacups that are themed base uh, that are themed on winnie the pooh all mm -hmm. these things we already have in the parks that i visited before so only the peter pan ride and the voyage to the crystal grotto were really new to me and also i didn't have the opportunity to visit the castle world true that's the only attraction that i haven't done okay but yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. And well, I just want to kind of get it back on track so we can. Uh, I kind of want to cover like how did uh, on my show notes it says how did you get there? <laughs> so I guess my question is because China is um, a communist country and they control you know how people get in and out. Like how is um, getting you know buying tickets, uh, booking you know airfare and stuff like that, and also getting visas? Okay. So, um, booking airfares are not really different when you go to China than if you want to go somewhere else. So, um, I don't have a lot to, to say about it. Okay. Um, but there, there is the visa part. It's a bit tricky, but it's just like administration. So, it's not as painful, I think, as people think it is. So, it's basically uh, you just <laughs> Google how to do to get a visa to China. You go to the local China embassy or something and you're gonna fill like uh, uh, like a, a form a very annoying and long form at least in Belgium it was very annoying and long <laughs> and then like uh, a week later you're gonna get your visa so it's not a big deal actually to to, to go in China um, but and, and then to book the, the tickets to Disneyland uh, it was a bit tricky because um, you have to separately book your hotel stay and your uh, uh, admission tickets. Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible at all. It's just you have to understand how it works because I think it works very differently. You know, maybe it was the same in the US, but in Paris, uh, it's like uh, the, the main, you have the main package. If you want to go to the hotel, uh, uh, admission tickets are included, period. Oh. So it was a bit, yeah. 
so I think you can uh, book uh, like uh, just hotel stays, but then you have to to go through a very different process, and it's like a custom made reservation that they do for you. It's like complicated. So uh, yeah, it was a bit different to book uh, to Shanghai when you used to the um, Paris mm-hmm. uh, reservation system. Okay. Um, how was uh, your travel there? Were there any like surprises? Anything that um, really surprised you? Because you said you've been to Hong Kong Disneyland, but that's on Hong Kong, not mainland China. Right. Uh, well, it's not really related about Disneyland, but in China there are a couple of stuff that you should know uh, about health mainly, like don't drink uh, tap water or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, every hotel in mainland China are giving away uh, free bottled water, so just drink this water and then you won't have any trouble. But I wouldn't say there are a lot of difference. Maybe um, the, the the cast members in Hong Kong or Paris are more a bit more familiar with English, but I must say that about the cast members, all of them from the uh, a place where they they should talk in an international language like English for say like the Disneyland Hotel. Of course, a, a lot of cast members there will talk in English more easily. But when when you're on the park uh, with cast members that maybe aren't supposed to talk a lot with the guests, like if they're operating a ride, mm-hmm. um, most of them, well, all of them are super friendly really super friendly, even more than in Paris, you know, I think that in Paris you have a uh, 50-50 chance to have like this cast member that won't give you a smile, something like that. In in Shanghai, maybe it's just the beginning of something, but uh, all the cast members are very, very friendly, and if they don't, uh, if they're not able to talk in English, they will do their best to maybe find a solution or find a cast member that speaks English. So really, uh, I have a lot of great experiences with the cast members in, in Shanghai. And yeah, they were very, very helpful and friendly. Okay. That's good. Um, so let's get into the resort a little bit. Uh, you, you Did you stay on property? I forget if you've said that or not. I did. Uh, I stayed at the Disneyland Hotel. Okay. And it was really nice. Uh, so, well, you know, I live in Belgium. And the uh, Art Nouveau style is very common here uh, in Brussels. And Art Nouveau is uh, the, the, the style they use to team the um, Disneyland Hotel in Shanghai. And they incorporated a lot of characters as well. So um, in Disneyland Paris, we have the, the Disneyland Hotel, which is like, like Victorian style, a bit like the Grand Floridian, for say. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a very, very slight layer of characters and Disney touch. And it's the complete opposite in the Shanghai Disneyland Hotel. You have characters everywhere. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's bad because at least they are integrated nicely. So you have like these statues and n- nothing is like off the theme, of the Art Nouveau theme. But, but you should expect a lot of Disney characters everywhere, especially like the, in the elevators. Um, on every level, you, ha- you will have this mini, Mickey, Mickey Mouse voice in English and Minimai, and Minimai, well, sorry, <laughs> she's my English, Minnie Mouse voice in Chinese that will say, oh, it's the first floor and stuff like that. <laughs> it's becoming a little m- too much characters to me. Uh, but I understand the demand of Disney characters when people visit the Disney park. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot, lot of them, but it's very nicely integrated. Yeah. Well, it, um, yeah go ahead. Um, sorry, you know, you continue. I was going to segue into something else. Keep going. Okay. Um, about the um, Shanghai Disneyland Hotel, um, you have like I haven't had the, the opportunity to have the breakfast here uh, because um, I just spent one night and two days, and I really wanted to make the most of my stay in the parks and take advantage of the attractions. Mm-hmm. So I really, it's like I arrived like at 10 p.m. at the hotel. Um, and all the restaurants from the hotel and um, Disney Disney Town shopping and dining district, all of them were closed at 10 
10 p.m., something like that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't expect it to be closed. Uh, so there was like a, a tiny, tiny food counter when you can still buy like snacks and stuff like that. But if you want to eat in the evening at your hotel or actually everywhere else in Disneyland, uh, in Shanghai Disneyland, the theme parks, um, make sure to eat early on because if you used to eat a little later, if you, you may face a lot of closed doors. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Because I think most, I think all of the Disney resorts are at least open later. Um, oh. Restaurants, except Disney in Paris. Really? When the th oh my God, it's a mess. <laughs> really a mess. No, it's really annoying. Um, for say when the theme parks is open, like in the high peak of summer, and the park <laughs> is open until like uh, 10 p.m. something like that. So mm -hmm. uh, um, the restaurants, well, it's like you, you will have like three restaurants that are open until the end of the, the the operating day but it's like the one hot, hot dog counter on main street and like a true restaurant i think there is like just one that's open until the end of the day so it's really really annoying that's but weird that's paris. yeah <laughs> that's and everyone just kind of shrugs and says that's paris <laughs> so yeah <laughs> um did you go to the disney village or whatever the whatever their downtown disney area is um i think it, well <laughs> That's what I was telling, actually. Yeah. Uh, I went to the Disney Town Center. After, okay, that's what it's called. Uh, so, uh, after park closing. And I think all of the restaurants and shops there are still open just one hour after park closing. So huh. when, I wa when I was leaving the park, uh, most of the restaurants and uh, shops were closed already. Uh, there's just the World of Disney Megastore that's, that remains open very late. So it's like this giant store when you can find I guess all the best selling items from the theme park boutique mm -hmm. um, yeah it's well I would say that the merchandise in uh, Shanghai Disneyland was not appealing at all um, when I'm in the US Disney parks I, I buy a lot of stuff like nice t-shirts and stuff like that books and uh, in Shanghai it was really disappointing. Hmm. Um, I think it's on par with the merchandise in Paris, so it's not very. It's very generic. It's, okay. It looks like the the uh, the Disney stuff that you could buy at Walmart or something. So, I'm maybe I'm exaggerating it a little bit right now, but it's not really. Uh, you won't find a lot of uh, uh, merchandise that are really based off the attractions uh, or something, a t-shirt that you would actually wear or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of my merchandise budget. Yeah. What? Um, actually, we had a question from Mr. Derek Bergen, a <laughs> theme park blogger extraordinaire and two-time <laughs> Disney gold medal winner, uh, Ron Disney medal winner. Um, he actually asked, right. uh, how is the uh, merch situation at uh, Shanghai? And um, he wanted to know if it was unique and plentiful like the Wizarding World or more generic, oh. like uh, Tokyo. But I, th I would say that the Wizarding World is a very a part, it's very specific. Uh, it's uh, The whole land is completely integrated. You have the rides, you have the food that you can find in the movies and the, the merchandise as well. So I'm not even sure they could have done it in Sh with Shanghai yeah. Disneyland. So you have this big franchise, it's like Pirates of the Caribbean or Tron. But you won't find um, Barbie like items or something like that. There's not like signature food mm -hmm. or signature uh, merchandise items like uh, the magic wands from Harry Potter or uh, lightsabers or something. So that is really missing in Shanghai. But I'm not even sure that they could have done it in a way that's not like shoehorned. So. Yeah. But um, speaking about the merchandise, uh, there there are a couple of well, my favorite bits of merchandise were uh, in the Adventure Isle uh, part of the park, mm -hmm. uh, and you have this uh, merchandise that is based of the, uh, the the the, cro the giant crocodile from the raft ride, the Roaring Rapids, and also the rope rope course. 
uh, Camp Discovery Challenge Trails, and there are like a couple of nice items and nice keyrings uh, and a lot of stuff for the, the kids, like uh, the a crocodile that is um, uh, designed in a cartoonish way. Uh, it's really nice, but I would say that I was, yeah, I didn't buy a lot of it actually. And even Tron, I was so hyped about what I could find about uh, Tron. Um, merchandise wise and even there uh, I think all about was like uh, two Tron pins uh, what did I buy and yeah a couple of um, uh, Discovery Adventure Isle hearings or something but um, it's really not a lot yeah that's that's interesting because uh, one of the big things um, at Tokyo is that uh, the Japanese culture they don't have a lot of things necessarily so what happens is a lot of their stores are dedicated to snacks and what what uh, they do is they buy snacks for all their friends and co-workers at home and then they give them the snacks and they eat them and then they can just throw away you know they, they're not they don't have things so there's yeah. like this weird crazy amount of just like cookies and stuff and not necessarily uh like mugs or t-shirts or you know trinkets like we it's have, and yeah, it's it's really uh, weird. <laughs> um, well, it's uh, the adaptation of a product to its market is interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the 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 Chinese people were like crazy about the um, turkey leg. There was like this giant line for just buying a turkey leg, <laughs> and you you, won't, you don't have the turkey leg in Paris. Mm -hmm. So I know it's popular in the US. Yes, but I've never seen it that popular in the U.S. as I've seen it in Shanghai. It was really insane. That's that's nuts. The, I've never had a turkey leg because the concept to me is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I like meat. I'm not against it. It's just the the saddest. I saw a, a few years ago. I was walking through Animal Kingdom and I saw this family of like five, like the grandma, mm -hmm. the two parents, and the two kids, and they were sitting on the hot concrete in Discovery Island, and they all had turkey <laughs> legs like in the middle of the day, and they looked miserable. Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I just and I was just like, oh my god, this is this is the this is the epitome of turkey legs in my opinion. It's just it's just like <laughs> grease and hot pavement and just. Just yeah. like sadness, <laughs> but that's that's it's cream sadness. Yeah, it's that's interesting because I I forget who I follow, but it's the one account that does a lot of the Disneyland, uh, Shanghai Disneyland stuff. He tweets out a lot of photos and stuff, and one of the things is like they sell like two thousand of them a day, two thousand turkey legs a day, or something well, crazy. And like he also said, they get they're flown in from Poland or something crazy. <laughs> so, really? Yeah, I was just like, what? So that's that's okay. absolutely crazy to me. Yeah. Um, so that's just bizarre turkey legs of all things. Yeah, go, go figure. Um, so let's actually start talking about the park now. <laughs> Yay! Half hour in. Um, so that's let's okay. yeah, let's start off with Mickey Avenue. Um, this is a really, I, I think this is one of the more interesting places because it seems like they kept a lot of Main Street, but they went different with it in a lot of ways mm -hmm. too. Do you want to kind of explain it? Yeah. So Mickey Avenue, it's like this shorter version of Main Street USA that is not based of a Victorian uh, US Victorian decoration and, and theme but it's based on various and mostly classic Disney characters so and every every building and every outlet is themed uh, on a, a specific character so the main uh, shop so it's not the Emporium it's like Mickey or uh, Mickey Arcade or something mm -hmm. so you have this giant shop that is based on Mickey and uh, you also have like the um, uh, Scrooge uh, I think it's Scrooge in English Scrooge uh, Bank yeah and uh, actually this this building host is hosting them uh, like uh, like 20 cashiers or something from for the whole um, boutique, for, for for the whole store, so it's really interesting because you have one giant room for the store itself, and then you have another building slash room that it's just the the the, the cashiers. Huh. Uh, and on the other side of the Mickey Avenue, you have mini Mouse confectionery. So these are like uh, treats and candies. Uh, you have Chip and Dale uh, treat parlor, and you also have 
uh, Remy's Patisserie, which is a very, very tasty bakery. Uh, and you have this gorgeous view on Gardens of Imagination and the castle. Um, it's, it's interesting because it reminds me a lot of... Uh, Buena Vista Street in Disney California Adventure. Mm -hmm. Th there is really uh, uh, the same vibe. There is like, like jazz music from the the fifties. So you have these actual jazzy standards from the the fifties. So you have like Benny Goodman and stuff like that. But you also have in the same type of orchestration um, the main themes from uh, Frozen or Mary Poppins or many Disney classics. So it's really a nice blend. Uh, for the, they, they did for this music loop, but the, it's really strange because um, it's it sort slightly half baked in my opinion mm -hmm. on every facade. All the facades are really nice, but the very concept of it, like uh, every building is themed on a specific character. It's like I've seen this uh, this this concept architectural concept in so many theme parks in my life uh, so you you will have the the house that looks like a power chip and next to it you have like this house uh, that will look, look uh, like a, a dollhouse and then mm -hmm. so it's 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 very theme parky uh, but at least the execution is really really nice um, uh, for the well except for the marquee signs all of them are made in like material, like it's not plastic, but it should be laminated or something. And it's, it's really team because you have like these beautiful tiny houses and on front of it, so uh, those houses are made in wood or something like that and really nice materials. And in front of these really nice materials, you have these tacky looking materials that, may, that, are, that make them Marky sign, so it's really a strange mix of materials. So it's an, an odd combination. Okay. But overall, it looks very nice, and I, I recommend everybody that visits Shanghai Disneyland to not just stay on the main avenue because uh, on the sideways you have these tinier streets, and these ones are like my favorite. There is like a building that is slightly industrial there is like a uh, like a food court inside of it but it's really nice and uh, yeah it's it's really a strange mix because you will have a, an automobile garage that's based of cars and in front of it you will have this uh, like pizzeria that is based on uh, lady and the tramp and it's so, you know, it's a really strange mix of older and newer franchises, but overall it's really, really cute. Yeah. And if I had to choose, I, 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 pref I would prefer uh, the Buena Vista Street. This, this main area is my favorite of all the Disney parks. I love the vibe. Yeah, and it's interesting that both uh, Mickey Avenue and Buena Vista Street have a Carthay Circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really weird. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think I miss like... Uh, kinetic elements like on Buena Vista Street you have the tram or the the, fount the water fountain or something and uh, I think it's slightly lacking on uh, main, uh, Mickey Avenue mm -hmm. also something else that is really different and I think not in a good way it's uh, in front of the Mickey Avenue you have this uh, train station looking building that it's actually not a train station uh, and in front of it, you have this uh, large floral Mickey, and on the right of this flower bed, uh, that's where they located guest services. So uh, when you need something in the theme park, you have to go back all the way in the very, very entrance of the park. It's mm -hmm. basically near the admission ticket check, so it's really, it's it's a long walk to just ask how does Wi-Fi work and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, oh, and Wi-Fi is another thing that I should cover as well because it's complicated at this moment. Huh, really? Just... Yeah. So they have like a, wi a working Wi-Fi network, but they have to use the Chinese way to access the internet because it's very, uh, very restricted. So um, 
you have to use a phone number. You have to, to like to log in with your phone number to get an access uh, to the the Wi-Fi network. So you type your uh, cell phone number, and then you're supposed to receive a text message with a code to access the internet. It's everywhere. You, uh, everywhere you go in China, whatever it's Starbucks or the Apple Store or Disneyland, uh, you will have the same system. Hmm. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you, it only works at this moment, it only works with the Chinese phone number. So if you are from the US, or from overseas, from Europe, uh, you can try to uh, put your uh, foreign uh, phone number and it won't work. So uh, after two days, uh, I went to guest services and I asked this very nice cast member that suggested that, that she type, uh, she, she, she uses her own uh, cell phone to receive the text message and then uh, we used the text message code that she received on my mobile phone and then I, succe uh, I successfully had an access to the internet. Huh. But it's very, very, you know, it's very complicated. So, um, but at least uh, there is a way uh, to access the internet, but if you can know how to do it in advance, it will save you a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of headaches and <laughs> like, what's going on? What am I doing yeah. wrong? I can't access to Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's talk about a little about uh, Gardens of Imagination. This is a kind of a new concept for Disney, I'd say. Um, I think it, it's just it's just a giant garden, um, and it has the carousel and Dumbo there. And also, yeah. it's kind of like their performance area, best way to put it, I guess, where a lot of the shows and fireworks and stuff happen. Yeah, so it's like this very large garden in front. Uh, it's, it's located um, between Mickey Avenue and the castle. And uh, I didn't really enjoy this part of the park. It felt a bit dry. Um, it's like, well, maybe in the coming years, well, nature will grow up. Uh, I think it will help, but at this very moment, it feels a bit, uh, a bit empty, but not just empty of people, but empty of things to do, empty of greenery. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really odd. So, uh, you have these, these two family attractions. So there's Dumbo and uh, Fantasia Carousel, but, um, I don't know, it, it doesn't provide a lot of life to the land. So I, I, I get that it, it's the point of this area and a nice place when you can sit on a bench to have some rest. But it's very strange. And then you have this very large chunk of land that is actually an audience area that's right in front of the castle. And most of the time, it will remain empty of people because there isn't a show going on from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, to, to 8 a.m. To, uh, to 10 p.m. So it's really strange. You, you have this really uh, large portion of land that is de dedicated to just remain empty for most of the day. Mm -hmm. And it's really sad because it prevents people to enter the castle through the front gate. I think it's the same configuration in, in um, the Magic Kingdom in Florida. But uh, here in, in Shanghai, it's like even the path that can lead to the front entrance of the castle, uh, it's not like they are hidden, but when you visit the park, uh, once you're in the, in the different lands, you won't, you won't go, you won't visit that part of the park uh, very uh, very often mm -hmm. so there are really uh, very few sh chances that you enter the castle like a real prince or princess I think that it's a missed opportunity um, but I don't know I'm not really a fan of this land and the most weird thing is I, I know I'm repeating what I've told in my review so sorry if I sound <laughs> if it sounds familiar to you but the, um, the central hub sort of flex in this Shanghai Disneyland Park because uh, the, the area that serves this purpose is located on the Esplanade right behind the castle. It's the, the, um, the pass that you will use the most when you want to go from Tron to Pirates or from uh, the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train to the Jetpacks. Uh, uh, and you never, you, you won't 
use the gardens of imagination to go from the left side to the right side. So uh, I love the idea that they try to do something very different. And and but um, I I'm not really convinced about that gardens of imagination that uh, as it is right now. Okay. Um, so let's actually get into the real good stuff now. Um, Yay. Yeah, let's get into Tomorrowland. Uh, I know I know you really like Tron, uh, so we can oh, cover. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can call it, talk about that a little bit, and also if there's any other attractions in Tomorrowland you want to talk about. Well, uh, there are basically four attractions in in uh, Tomorrowland: the jetpacks, which is basically the astro orbital thing, but uh, flawless. I mean, it's like a suspended roller coaster. Yeah. It's, it's just a spinning ride. So I haven't rode this one because it was like one hour wait for just <laughs> this type of ride, and I wanted to save my time for more precious things. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's really it's really nicely done. Um, you have uh, next to right next to it. You have this uh, uh, stitch encounter attraction uh, that you have in the states as well. I think that you have it in the states. I'm not sure actually. The we stitch? have it in Paris. It's called Stitch uh, Encounter. Yeah, we have. I don't know if we have Stitch Encounter, but we do have the Finding Nemo Crush okay. Turtle Talk concept. Yeah. Okay. Well, it ba- it's basically the same, but with Stitch. Mm-hmm. So I haven't been uh, visiting Stitch in Shanghai because we have the same in Paris, and it's really aimed to the little kids. Mm-hmm. And right next to it, you have the Buzz Lightyear attraction, which is a nice improvement on the Buzz Lightyear laser blast attraction that we have in the various... Well, I think that every Disney Castle Park has it now. I think so. Yeah. They all uh, does. Just uh, Hong Kong have it? No, no, no. Uh, no, no. They have it in Hong Kong. So. Oh, okay. Maybe, yeah. They all have it now. So yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's a nice improvement because uh, for the uh, for the the pre- previous iteration of the ride, they I I'm, I don't, I don't know why they use this, but it's like they based the whole attraction on the TV series instead of the famous. Pixar movies. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really not a fan. I'm really not a fan of the TV show and the graphic. Well, the art direction of it. Mm-hmm. So I think it looks really tacky in all the Disney parks uh, where this attraction is located. But here in the Shanghai Park, they had the bright idea to use the graphics from the, the Pixar movies, which is a nice improvement. And it's like you're on the planet Zerg something. And every target is a screen, so it's a very noticeable difference. Well, uh, uh, not only about this attraction, but uh, in the whole park you have screens and media projection everywhere. Not just in Paris or Tron, but in every attraction you have uh, nice touches of media. And so on Buzz Lightyear, every every target is a screen, so they are like various sizes, and they are just like it's like a, an eye that's blinking when you hit a target. Mm-hmm. And uh, from what I remember, the um, responsivity responsiveness of uh, the guns have been improved compared to the older versions. So it's really uh, a seamless experience when you shoot everywhere. But it's uh, the type of attraction that I've only done once because, I don't know, it's one is enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and plus you have it locally too, so you, you totally get yeah, that. Yeah, Okay, well, let's get into Tron then. <laughs> oh, finally. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Tron is mind-blowing. I know that on picture, when I was looking at pictures uh, of the outside canopy of Tron, it looked and it, it it does look very similar to a shopping mall or a modern stadium, mm-hmm. but it really comes alive at night. Uh, I must say that the Tron exterior of Tron and um, the whole Tomorrowland is more it's more beautiful in the little details than it is on the bigger picture. So uh, in the walls of the land, you will have like these um, futuristic shapes engraved. Uh, everywhere, like it's actually like those giant buildings were made with a 3D printer. So it's really strange and kind of cool. But I think the the whole Tomorrowland calls for less details than the Pirates Land. So if you accept that, 
uh, it's very cool actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so the trunk canopy, uh, despite the fact that it looks very uh, similar to existing um, contemporary architecture, like you can find in Shanghai, ironically, um, it's it's really cool because you have a lot of kinet kinetic energy uh, coming out of it. Because because uh, every 30 seconds, when it works good, uh, you have these trains, trains that, that brings a lot of life to the land. Uh -huh. And it's really, really cool. So um, for riding Tron, you will have to uh, leave any lug every luggage in the lockers. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that they had to uh, add a couple of lockers, extra lockers, because I guess it wasn't enough what they planned. It's a bit of a hassle, so uh, when you visit, and it's an advice that I would that uh, that you can have for uh, all the parks that uh, really uses lockers like Universal, mm -hmm. uh, it may be a good idea to leave all um, large backpacks in your hotel room and uh, try to have just try to bring with you just things that can fit in your pockets. Yeah, because, travel light. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, there is like a switch, a short switch back line in front of the uh, show building entrance. But once you're inside the show building in, uh, and the, the inside of the queue line, it's so, so cool. So you have this pre-show. It's very tiny, tiny room where you have like 20 people inside of it. Mm -hmm. And you are facing this large blue window. It's like a window, but it's like a projection screen. And there are like futuristic shapes that, that are moving and, and all of a sudden these shapes are disappearing and this screen becomes actually a um, transparent window uh, with a direct view on the launch of a train. So it's, it was really interesting because um, it was interesting to think that the pre-show has to be synced on the launch of every train. Yeah. It's, so when I was in was when I was visiting, there was a lot of um, uh, operational issues on Tron, but uh, the whole thing looks very very complex to operate. Uh, but it, it, otherwise, it's an incredible ride. So uh, you are in well uh, after this first pre-show, it's like you are really into the 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 world of the grid. So mm -hmm. it's really dark and glowing, and with the music of the, the, the original soundtrack from Daft Punk, it's really, really intense, uh, especially when you arrive in the loading area. The music is very loud, and everything, well, the it, it looks just like the movies, with all the glowing glasses and stuff. It's really, really neat. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that pr that pre-show is the the pre-show with the uh, transparent uh, with the you know the window that goes from frosted to transparent is probably like I, I saw the pirates you know ride through all that fun stuff, but that was probably the most impressive effect I saw in the whole park. Like really, whoa, yeah. kind of thing. Absolutely, and it's 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 amazing because it's a lot of dated technology. It's just a frosted. Um, Frosted glass. I don't, I'm not sure what you when you what you would call this in English. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's it's um, it's a like it's like uh, they put electricity to the glass. So yeah. um, when there's electricity to it, it's frost. It looks frosted. Um, but when there's no electricity, it becomes clear. Uh, it's been yeah. around since like even the late '90s. But it's the combination, as you were saying, of like, hey, we can project stuff on this Absolutely. and put it here and make it look really cool. But it is. It is even more cool in real life. Nice. I wish I wasn't spoiled before I see it in the, uh, in real life, but anyway, it was still amazing. Cool. And it really one of my favorite effects in the whole park, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ride, it's well, the the ride itself is very short, but um, it's I think it's the the indoor roller coaster that I've done that features mm, uh, a lot of props and decoration uh, there are like shapes and mirrors and screens there was like two giant screens at the end of the track mm -hmm. but overall there are like uh, very clever tricks at some point your train is facing a mirror uh, but uh, they turn the lights of the trains red 
So you have the impression that you are competing against another train that is team, from Team Red. Yeah. Um, but it's actually just a mirror, and it's so simple, and it works so great. So it's it's really cool, and there are a lot of things like that in the in the ride. A lot of, a lot of uh, interesting effects that are really simple, but that works so so good. Nice, yeah. Um, how comfortable are the actual vehicles themselves? Because um, there's various other Vacoma motorbike coasters, and I've heard mixed kind of things about how comfortable they are. They are. Do you want to kind of speak to that and also, um, also like, you know, how it is operating the ride? Because I've heard some issues of people not fitting or taking a while to exit and load and stuff. Okay. So, uh, well, first in front of the attraction, uh, at the end, uh, well, at the, uh, before the entrance, you have these uh, um, light cycle smoke ups uh, like you have in most intense attractions now. So you can just make sure that you fit in the seats before you wait for like two hours and yeah. then told that you can try it. Sort of like the uh, Forbidden uh, Journey benches they have outside of yeah. ho- of Hogwarts. Exactly. Uh, now it's it's confusing. I know it was the first time I ride uh, a bike coaster from Vekoma. Mm-hmm. And despite the fact that I'm really used to safety... Uh, explanations and how to put yourself in specific seats on every attractions. Um, it was a bit, bit tricky to understand how I had to put my legs on this uh, because there are so many moving parts to support your parts of the legs. I, I don't know. Uh, but um, So it's a bit tricky, but once you have been once, w- once you get how it works, it's not supposed, it's not that hard. Yeah. But so, something that is confusing as well is, is that uh, one people out of two are supposed to go uh, on the other side of the train. And it's something that uh, on most roller coasters, uh, it's absolutely forbidden to do. So uh, even though there are a lot of signage and, and uh, uh, safety and explanations and stuff like that, it's a bit confusing to be told for only f- uh, for this roller coaster to go through the track to 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 get on your seat. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a bit it's a bit special, but, but um, and I wouldn't say that it's a very comfy attraction, especially on the end when you have to wait for like uh, thirty seconds before you reach the unload area. Uh, but um, it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's not comfortable, it's just not the most comfortable uh, type of seats uh, on a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, they had, because, well, I think, I think that they expected the people to be confused and they really successfully uh, handle it because they have like two loading areas but also two unloading areas. So it's not like the rock and roller coaster when you have like two. Oh no! Anyway, no. Sorry, I'm I'm confusing. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> sorry fine. Sorry about it. It's a lot of coasters. But uh, what can I say more about Tron? I don't know. You guys have to ride. It's good. Ride it. <laughs> good. Go there. Ride it. It's it's a, it's a it's an amazing ride. And uh, there is just one thing I would say about Tron. Uh, when I came back here, uh, you know, here in Paris, we have the Space Mountain, which is very different than all of the other Space Mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, I discovered the U.S. Space Mountains, uh, like, uh, for the very past years. And I've, I really thought it was very dated attractions. And I know that for some people, it's really important to keep things alive, even if they're outdated. So... Uh, I understand the nostalgia that can go with the rides that you want to keep uh, mm-hmm. for uh, for a longer amount of time. But once you ride such contemporary rides that you can really compare with the Space Mountain experience in the case of Tron, I mean, without a doubt, I prefer the experience, the over experience of Tron, than keeping a dated ride like Space Mountain for the sake of keeping it. Yeah. Well. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand what you mean. Okay. So, if I had to choose, I would, uh, well, 
without a doubt, I prefer Tron than a Space Mountain that feels like very 80s and very basic roller coaster. Mm-hmm. But I, I understand nostalgia, but if I had to choose, I would go for contemporary attractions. Okay, that makes sense. Can't argue with that. Um, let's go on to Fantasyland now. Um, there's two unique rides. I mean, you touch on this a little bit, that there's uh, copies of, you know, uh, of uh, Winnie the Pooh and the teacups and stuff like that, and there's the uh, Frozen yeah. show there. Um, the two unique rides there are Voyage of the Crystal Grotto and their new version of Peter Pan, which, um, do you want to talk about those a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. Cool. Um, so the Peter Pan attraction uh, has been tremendously upgraded to current standards. So uh, it's basically the same ride system, uh, the same hanging bows that we have in the U.S. and uh, Paris parks. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you have a lot of uh, um, video projection, and they are made in a very, very subtle way, just like the Alice in Wonderland that's been updated in Anaheim. It's really the same amount of uh, seamlessness, I would say. So it's interesting because you have actual audio animatronics and the same characters, but in CGI. Well, it's like a traditional animation, Mm -hmm. but uh, projected. And it's really seamless. I mean, of of course, you can see that some some of the characters our video and some are actual props and audio animatronics, but it's really, really good. Uh, um, and I was really am- amazed because they used the projectors sometimes for very, very subtle details. For say, at some point, you're flying over islands and stuff. Mm-hmm. So basically, you're uh, above the level of water and they. <clears throat> use some projectors to add some very, very subtle waves that are projected on the uh, floor of the attraction, which is the water. Oh, okay, yeah. So a lot of people could actually miss that effect, but if you if you happen to see it, you're like, man, these guys, it, they, they, they're pushing the envelope so much further. It's, it's really amazing. And if you visit, visit Shanghai Disneyland, do not skip Peter Pan. Really, do not skip Peter Pan. It's really a tremendous upgrade on the traditional ride. Mm-hmm. And I really hope they can upgrade all of these classic attractions that good. Yeah. We were talking about attractions like Space Mountain that are dated. Uh, maybe I, uh, I prefer contemporary rides because they've been upgraded in ways that, are, that do not feel very contemporary actually but if they would if they add some layers of uh modern uh, effects in the way they did on peter pan of alice in wonderland Mm -hmm. i think that would do the job actually yeah and 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 another thing uh, that's different is the ride system is more like a uh powered coaster i think oh oh, really i don't know yeah it's Uh, um, for me for me it was the same okay so maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, it, it, maybe it's I'm just. Um, guy, so. Yeah, maybe it's a little more um, modern ride system. But yeah, from what I understand, it's like a powered coaster, so it coasts a little bit. But it's. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it's it's I I what was it? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's it's magnetic uh, stuff. I I don't know. I I don't think it's magnetic. I just think it's powered, as in the ride vehicles themselves can go up and like go up and down hills, but they can also coast a little bit. Kind of like those. Okay. Oh well. Yeah. They they do coast a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I think that's uh, that's my understanding. They do as well. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. So. so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, do not skip it. Really. <laughs> yeah, do not skip. Really good. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Voyage of the Crystal Grotto? This one is interesting to me because I watched a video of this and I wasn't that impressed, but. Maybe that's because it's a video on YouTube. Do you want to speak to this uh, a little bit? Uh, in my opinion, it's not because it's it was a YouTube video, actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's the one ride that was really a disappointment to me. Okay. Uh, not like I expected it to be much greater. But uh, so basically, what it, what is it? It's like the ride system of the um, Jungle Cruise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like... Uh, 
uh, boats and every boat has a skipper. I'm not sure the skipper is talking. I don't remember. Uh, uh, but uh, the boats are cruising along various themed fountains and every water fountain it's very elaborate and in, uh, each of them is themed uh, uh, on a Disney animated classic mm -hmm. so you have like one scene based on Beauty and the Beast and one of the theme uh, water fountain based on Tangles stuff like that uh, it's a bit odd uh, uh, it's I wouldn't say it's the execution because you know, it's Disney, so the execution now, I think it's the, the it's always flawless. Uh, but it's, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Can you describe what you saw? Because even to me, <laughs> it's a bit hard to explain. Actually. I think the, the issue I had when I saw it was that it didn't seem fully fleshed out, I don't feel like. Um, I feel like, the, the, I, I think the idea of going past uh, fountains... Um, you know, and, and character sculptures and all that stuff is a good idea, but combining, uh, it, it's not, the fountains aren't as good as World of Color, which I think is one issue, and also I don't think the set, the, the, um, actual sets themselves are as good as, like, say, the storybook canal boats. So I feel like you... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I feel like you get, it, it, like, the idea of World of Color plus fantasy, the, uh, sorry, the World of Color plus the canal boats is a sounds like a good idea it just doesn't seem like they picked the the right things from each segment to make it like the fountains yeah. are pretty basic and the the figures and the sets aren't detailed enough yeah it's it, it's a strange combination yeah and then also i didn't um, i didn't get any uh, vibe of interaction from your driver yeah i can't remember any of that yeah. So what's the point of having a driver? I don't know. Yeah, like that—that that just doesn't make sense to me. Like you—you you think that I like I understand you don't want to have you know someone talking Mandarin and you know have to do English and all sorts of stuff. But if you could offer some sort of—I mean, it could have been like a great movie ride sort of thing where you know like talking about you know going and driving around and like oh you know you remember Aladdin you know and all that stuff and you know mm -hmm. kind of like or tell a backstory like. Or something like that, but instead, it just—it just kind of is there. It seems like something's missing. I can't put Absolutely. my finger on it. And I was expecting uh, to be much more impressed with the finale in the uh, uh, behind the castle. So you have this grotto, and it basically—it's just like uh, jewels uh, projected on the, the the walls of the cave. So mm -hmm. uh, it was okay. Yeah, it, it's not it's it's not bad, but it's not good either. So maybe it's a cultural cultural thing. I don't know. Maybe they like gardens and fountains, and I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. But in in Fantasyland, you the grotto. You have the Alice in Wonderland maze. So mm -hmm. in Paris, we have the the same type of maze, but it's based on the Alice in Wonderland animated movie. And this yeah. one is based uh, on the Tim Burton uh, film that was released, la released like five years or so. Yeah. And I'm really not a big fan of the movie or the direction of the movie. So, uh, once again, uh, the execution is great, but uh, it left me underwhelmed. Yeah, I, I saw a video of a walkthrough of that, um, that the, the infamous 30 minutes of that guy walking around with video. <laughs> Remember that one that came out? I um, haven't seen this one. Oh, okay, yeah, it was like the first video to come out of Shanghai Disneyland is basically this guy, it was like 30 minutes or 45 minutes long of him just walking around the park. And people were like, oh my god, this is exactly what I wanted. Um, oh, right, okay, I remember. Yeah, and... It, what I got from that vibe was that it wasn't, it didn't know what it wanted to be. It wasn't like, it wasn't trusting its audience, if that makes sense. Like, it's not elaborate enough to be a hedge maze, but also it's not elaborate enough to be a walkthrough. And the art direction, I was not a fan of, not just because I'm not a huge fan of the Tim Burton movies, but it seemed like a knockoff. Like, I feel like this is what you'd get in a, in a, like a Chinese 
Disneyland. I know what you mean. Yeah, because you're looking at like there's um those the part giant statue. Yeah, the giant statue, or they yeah, have those um, or you know they have those um blocks like they they're like the three segment uh they're like um pillars and they have three segments to them and you turn them around and you form different characters you know like oh right right yeah it looks like off brand uh like off just it looks off it doesn't look like anything it, it, it's just it's really bizarre it's yeah it, i know what you mean it, it doesn't it's look odd. like the it doesn't look like the characters it doesn't look like the actors it looks cheaply done it doesn't look very good um, it reminds me of the of the Chinese. It's a small world where they put in uh, the the Ninja Turtles <laughs> and the Power Rangers. <laughs> it, it just reminds me of that, and I'm like, ugh. So yeah, but uh, at least uh, the music from uh, uh, Danny Elfman is adding a very uncommon vibe uh, to a Disney Castle Park. You know, yeah, it's very. Uh, a bit of sweet. Uh, I'm not sure how to. It's uh, a bit quirky. Yeah. Uh, it's really nice to have this very new vibe added to a castle park. Yeah, it's it's yeah. That quirky is a nice. good word to use. Quirky, maybe a little eccentric. Um, yeah, definitely Danny Elfman. <laughs> totally. That's, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on to the uh, the the two in, probably two more interesting. Uh, lands uh visually and also i think content wise is a uh, treasure cove and adventure isle uh let's start with treasure cove um real quick and they have all the pirates this is pirate land pirates of the caribbean land uh, all the pirates uh they have the pirates of the caribbean battle for the shrunken treasure and then also um the captain jack show what uh the Absolutely. eye of the storm was it i think something like that eye of the storm yeah, well, uh, it's really interesting because this whole land is like based on the Pirates of the Caribbean movie franchise. Yeah, and uh, during construction of Shanghai Disneyland, uh, most of the fandom was wondering: is it, uh, is it like a, a an appropriate way to build a theme park to build such a massive land based on a single IP, uh, like they did with Harry Potter? Mm-hmm. Uh, or they're doing with Star Wars. Uh, I really don't know what to think about it because uh, I have nothing again against uh, IP-based land. But when it becomes that large, uh, you can wonder how it's going to age when the uh, frenzy will fade. But at this very moment, uh, it's really, really great, great looking. Uh, and the thing is that uh, compared to Harry Potter land, for say, this Pirates of the Caribbean themed land does not scream the movie franchise. It's like, to me, it was like, okay, it's like the pirate land, you know, mm-hmm. the, the general idea of a pirate and not the Pirates of the Caribbean movie franchise. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's kind of, this is a pirate area, but all the attractions and shows tie into Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that and makes sense. You, when, when you're walking uh, in the land, uh, it's very different than uh, visiting the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, when you can really, you, you're familiar with... Harry Potter lands, like uh, the Weasley's Boutique or something. You don't have this in the uh, Treasure Cove land in Shanghai. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, th- I think it's okay because, I don't know, it's another use of a great franchise. Uh, I know that many people now are like sick and tired of seeing uh, Pirates of the Caribbean being shoehorned uh, here and there in the U.S. parks. Uh, but we should not forget that for a, a whole generation... Jack Sparrow is there, Indiana Jones. Yeah, uh, it's like the same type of uh, family blockbuster movie with a charismatic main character. That's uh, uh, that, and it features a lot of humor. So it's, uh, I mean, you can really compare both franchises to me. And mm-hmm. I think that uh, a franchise like Pirates of the Caribbean and a character like Jack Sparrow definitely deserve an attraction. Maybe oh, yeah. not land, but definitely an attraction. And more than just being shoehorned into the current Pirates or that uh, that interactive show they had at Hollywood Studios for like a hot second. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about um, uh, sh- the Battle for Shrunken Treasure real quick, and then we can talk about the uh, yeah. the uh, live action show, which I think is really interesting too. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So the um, new Pirates of the Caribbean basically has very little to do with the older Pirates ride from Disney. Um, the ride system is completely different. From what I understand, uh, the ride system is a combination of technologies, including magnetic uh, propulsion, and there's also a truck uh, at the bottom of the uh, water water future. Mm-hmm. Um, the flume. The, when you yeah at the bottom of the flume um it's really really i think it's the most ambitious uh, attraction that disney has created in the last decade because um usually disney is really great they master theming and execution and mm-hmm. they make great use of all their technologies but they, they end up uh, making the best use of it, mastering it properly. And here on Pirates of the Caribbean, I think that it's uh, they, they created something very new in terms of ride system. So the ride system is a combination of various te- existing technologies, I think. Yeah. But the, re- the, the, the result, the experience is completely new. It's really, really so cool. Uh, so basically, uh, what it does, well, your boat... Uh, can move slower or faster. It can spin. It can go uh, uh, forward or backwards, mm-hmm. uh, and it can even go sideways. So it's really like your boat is sort of haunted. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, at some point, when you when you have the first interaction with Jack Sparrow, uh, uh, your slow moving boat suddenly starts to go faster and just that makes you feel what, what's going on here mm-hmm. uh, and then it rotates and go backwards but uh, you also have this uh, powerful embarked audio system and mm-hmm. it makes this version of Pirates of the Caribbean very much more dramatic uh, than the usual Pirates ride more cinematic uh, I would re- say most absolutely, it's uh, more close to attractions like uh, Gringotts or Forbidden Journey, mm-hmm. uh, because you really your boat is al- always at the heart of the action, you know, yeah. like Spider Man as well. Yeah. So the the attraction is a, a, a really great balance between sc- very large projection screens and tangible scenery because. In most cases now, these media-based attractions focus a bit too much on just the screens, mm-hmm. and then they have like a, a, a smaller layer of actual props and scenery and theming, and I think that that's, it's the perfect balance between those two on Pirates of the Caribbean in Shanghai. Mm-hmm. It's really, really great, and it doesn't even require 3D glasses, so... It's it's really cool. So you have your boat. Um, that that's, the story tells you that you are going underwater, which is a bit weird because your boat, despite the fact that the screens are showing you that you are underwater, your boat is still physically on a piece of water. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but um, it still works much better than the Rider Two ride. You know, in the Rider Two ride, you can see the black floor mm-hmm. in front of every screen so you have the same uh the same effect on pirates of the caribbean but i think that the screens are even larger than the ones from ratatouille or uh, larger from the last scene from gringotts you know the yeah the, the, the 360 scene from gringotts yeah so uh, uh it's it's even bigger and uh they succeed at attracting your your the, the point that you f- focus on uh, on points that are not too close from water so it works well and you also have these uh, very huge ships battleships and uh, you can see characters uh, fighting um, through the windows of the boat mm-hmm. but it's just pro- uh, projections so on every screen they used even it's a very tiny uh, projection screen. 
they used the uh, 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 technique from uh, the Spider-Man ride, which is called squinching by Universal, the perspective yeah. switch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's really, really, really great. Awesome. I mean, it's must, mastery to perfection. So I think that Pirates of the Caribbean, to me, it's like the most amazing attraction of the park, but also uh, Disney's most technologically uh, uh, advanced attraction in years. Yeah. Um, and one of the cool things, um, probably the number two effect that I was most blown away by in the whole park um, is, again, a simple effect that uses uh, existing technologies. It's the a skeleton to Jack Sparrow switch. Oh, with that first okay. AA. It's just using projection mapping on an AA, but how it's done is so great. <laughs> but I think uh, I think it's a combination of projection mapping. I'm not even sure it's on the AA, but I know they use Paper Ghost. It's very very hard to see, but they they succeed to hide the giant glass they use for the reflection. Yeah. Huh. Through the, the the ropes of the boat. So it's a combination of Pepper Ghost and uh, video mapping and audio animatronic. It's really, really Oh, really. So, it's, so it's more than just... I thought it was just projection mapping, which looked cool, but it's also uh, no, no, Pepper's no, no, it's, Ghost. It's even more amazing than that. Oh, my God. <laughs> you can really hear <laughs> people screaming and shouting like, what's going on? Yeah. Oh, and something else that I forgot to, to mention. So uh, when your boat... Uh, are facing some giant project. Well, the projection screen from the back to uh, how do you say that? Uh, when your boats are coming back on the surface of the water, mm -hmm. the boat not only moves sideways in front of the screen, but it it's also very slightly motion based. So uh, uh, your boat on the screen is like going up. Mm -hmm. But your boat provides you the same physical sensation as well. And you also get some uh, water sprinklers. So it's, uh, I mean, my point is there is even more than what you can see on a video. It's really, it's packed with special effects and 40 effects at every moment. It's awesome. really, really fascinating. It sounds like it's probably the best attraction in years and probably the best uh, attraction this year, hands down. Oh, definitely. That's that's awesome. That sounds fantastic. And also, um, for the ending, like you go up a little hill and backwards down a a, a little water slide. Right. Correct? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So it's the same type of uh, upside down drop as you have on Space Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Splash Mountain. Mm -hmm. But it's it goes it goes backwards. Yeah. But it's not like. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most amazing, uh, the most amazing thing that you will experience on the ride. I think the most amazing thing things are the uh, the cinematic sequences and the Jack Sparrow apparition. Uh -huh. It's even more spectacular that this general drop uh, back to, back backwards. Yeah, cool. Um, so it sounds great. I I I really hope that like. Disney wises up and they like bring that attraction to like Hollywood studios or something. I think that'd be a really cool addition, even though it may cause some brand confusion. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. But you know, it's the same point that, that I had with the space mountain versus Tron. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like, well, these are two very different types of ride in the end. Uh, maybe they can build a pirate's, new Pirates ride in the studios, and it would be a big deal that they have another Pirates base ride in the Magic Kingdom. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I'm not sure they're ready to do that. Yeah, true. Especially since it seems like this attraction alone was like a billion dollars. <laughs> I don't know if they want to spend that much money again. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that it actually costs like half a billion, but you know, these numbers are flowing around. And Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, no, there's, it's like um, box office. Uh, totals they can they, they're fudged very frequently <laughs> it's like yeah. uh, oh this attraction like i've heard multiple like amounts based on if they want to impress people by saving money or impress people by saying how much they spent so Absolutely. so it's just like eh, whatever um so the next uh, attraction that's i think um one of the this is up there with 
another attraction we're going to talk about in Adventure Isle. This is uh, the Jack Sparrow show, The Eye of the Storm. I was not expecting this kind of show or it to be this good. And I've just seen pieces of it. Uh, do you want to kind of explain what this show is and kind of the, some of the and some of the awesome yeah. parts in it? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, actually, it's the only uh, show from Shanghai Disneyland that I decided to go see. Okay, that, that's good. A, yeah, yeah. But I did my research because I, I'm not really into sh- theme park shows usually. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I've heard so many good praise about this one, so uh, it's well. I would say that all of the theater show buildings in Shanghai Disneyland, these are just huge. You wouldn't actually. It's they are so huge that uh, they have a little trouble to hide those giant show buildings mm-hmm. where in the park. So for some of them, they, they uh, put some backdrops in front of it, and it works quite well, especially in the Fandango Theater that hosts the Jack Sparrow show. Yeah. Uh, but uh, theaters like Frozen or the Walt Disney Theater on Main Street Avenue, uh, it's not really that good. But uh, speaking about what's inside the show building, uh, it's, it's basically uh, like a s- usual stunt show, not with cars but mm-hmm. uh it's it's i think it's uh similar to the sinbad show that there is in islands of adventure yeah so it's a lot of stunts and stuff like that except actually uh, a good show <laughs> except, actually, I, I don't know because i didn't understand the word of what they're, they were saying yeah. it's only chinese yeah so i was like just enjoying uh what i would what I, what I was seeing. Yeah. Uh, but at least that part was very good. Okay, that's good uh, at least. I think yeah. that the whole show is like uh, a lot of uh, small, smaller stunts mm-hmm. that lead to a grand finale that is mind blowing. I mm-hmm. didn't read anything about the show before, so I was really stunned. So, uh, basically, Basically, at the end of the show, the, some of the parrots are literally in the eye of the storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, how, how is it called, that, that thing that you, you have in Orlando as well? Uh, the giant air blasters, when you can ride... Yeah, I, the... I know you're talking about. When... the. It's like um, indoor skydiving. Yes, that's right. So, it's interesting because I saw this a video of this like choreography uh, in, in this type of technology. And I was like, man, they should do something inside of a theme park with this. And I was thinking about Epcot or something, but this was cleverly integrated into a, a larger setup. So mm-hmm. it was really, really uh, a great show. Nice. And so some of the effects that I saw were, um, they, it's it kind of starts out like a comedy show. And you know, there's a, you know, there's a sets and stuff like. It's not even sets. It's like, it looks like just a stage, right? Like yeah, it's it's almost like this uh, uh, preschoolers show that the parents go see yeah. <laughs> at the annual fair, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, you discover that giant. Uh, was it like a ship or something? Ship mm-hmm. sailing. And yeah, the 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 whole thing is. Well, it's spectacular, but really, it's the grand finale that is really is mind blowing. But yeah. it's really, I think there is a lot of comedy. I couldn't tell because I don't understand. But I have this uh, very surprisingly long pre-show uh, where it's just comedy bits and stuff yeah. like that before you enter the main theater. But the whole vibe of it is really, it's a it's a fun comedy show. Nice. Yeah. And what, what the real cool thing was like at the beginning that was cool is they have that fog blast like they have in T2 3D at Universal. Yeah. And then they reveal the whole set and everyone's like, whoa. And then then you have the giant um, the, the effect where Jack Sparrow gets caught in the storm and he's flying on the uh, indoor, uh, you know, the indoor skydiving kind of thing. Uh-huh. So, th- yeah. Th- yeah, those are it's really spectacular. It, um, is. it, it seems really cool. And that'd be another uh, another thing I'd like to see brought to the uh, state side. Maybe not the ride, but the show would be good. Oh, the show would fit totally, totally yeah. fit. And in uh, Treasure Cove, you have also mm-hmm. this interactive 
area, which is uh, Mermaid's Revenge. So basically, it's like a pirate ship uh -huh. where you have so many interactive activities. So you have like um, uh, touch screens that are like uh, paintings of Jack Sparrow. Uh, you can to touch everything. You can uh, you you can have like a, a water cannon fight. You can uh, you can have uh, what can you do? You can play with the maps, the you know the the maps with the rotating yeah. maps that you can see in the movies. Uh, it's really it's really fun. Uh, make sure to have a look at the Mermaid's Revenge if you visit Shanghai Disneyland. It's really oh, nice. Cool. Um, anything else in uh in uh, Treasure Cove that you want to talk about? And otherwise, we're going to move on to the last area. Well, uh, before we move on, there is this um, Barbosa's Boon Tea Restaurant, okay. which is basically the same uh, concept as the Blue Lagoons. Okay, so it's uh, an indoor restaurant that have like a uh, setting that uh, with a view on the passing boats from the attraction, and uh, uh, it's like a counter service restaurant. Uh, oh. most, most restaurants are counter service restaurants in the Shanghai Disney. Yeah, so it's not a fancy restaurant, so you can definitely go there. It's not going to cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. and it's a really nice, relaxing experience. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you maybe you have to fight to get a table view on the boats. Yeah. But otherwise, it's really uh, a very, uh, very nice restaurant. Really, it's my favorite from the theme park. That's nice. I didn't know it was a counter service. I thought it was like a sit down, like Blue Bayou was. No, 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 not at all. Actually, I think the only table service restaurant is located inside of the castle. Oh. So it's like a, a princess meet and greet. But uh, all uh, all other restaurants are moderately priced uh, counter service restaurants or fast food or something. Okay, that's not bad. Cool. Yeah. Um, so let's go to Adventure Isle. This seemed to be another one of your favorite places, uh, one of your favorite lands in the park. Um, oh, it was. Yeah, there's three attractions there, uh, but I want to cover the the most surprising one to me first, which is the Discovery Trail. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's it's so cool, and it's so unexpected that when I tell my friends about this, they were like, man, it's just a rope course. Come down. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, no, it's a rope, it's, it's a rope course on steroids. Imagine the, the, the same uh, level of scenery that you have in Animal Kingdom or Disney in Paris on the Adventure Isle or maybe Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Disney Sea. Mm -hmm. So it's very the same level of detail. There are so many details, so many things to see, so many water, water futures. Um, and you have like this rope course. Uh, uh, so, how does it work? Uh, first, you'll have to put all of your personal belongings in a uh, locker. There is an absolute nothing in your pockets policy. Okay. So, you have to queue in line for the lockers first, and then queue in line for the attraction. So, when you queue in line for the attraction, there is like this beautiful exploration theme that Disney loves so much, you know, with a lot of antique props and stuff like that mm -hmm. so this is one of my big favorites of all disney can do in terms of theming it's my favorite vibe uh and then uh at some point in the queue you are given a harness mm -hmm. and then at a, at a second spot some cast members uh will fasten you up in the harness to make sure that you that you are well, uh, that you are safe and good to go. Yep. And then you get to choose between three different paths. So there are three different uh, course, rope courses, uh, and each of them has a, uh, a separate uh, main focus or something. So one of the courses leads to uh, the back of the waterfall. Mm -hmm. So this is the one that I've that I've done, and the two. Others have a different theme. There's like an arbory themed uh, uh, discovery site or something. Uh, but it's really smartly done because um, uh, before I visit the park, I was like, how can it work? How can they avoid uh, traffic jams on these uh, tracks? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, on every track, uh, well, on every course, there is 
tracks. There are three separate tracks mm -hmm. and a lot of switches. So if you want to wait for your friends or go further in front of slower people, of things like that, or just take your time, you can freely move on the on the tracks without annoying uh, everyone else. So it's huh. very very cleverly done. Yeah, I didn't expect it. Uh, so you can. Well, you can really take your time and explore the scenery if you want. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want. And the great thing about it is in theme parks, we are used to uh, safety guards and uh, a lot of warning signs and safety nets and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that people don't hurt themselves. And here, it's like the same type of um, amazing mountains environment but you don't have all these annoying handrails and stuff like that so it feels even more like a natural scenery that's a natural environment yeah and that is amazing that sounds super cool yeah <laughs> it is it really is and i've only did it once because the line was a bit long mm -hmm. but um I, I i recommend that you do it several times because and even if you don't like me, if you don't have the chance to, to, to do all of the courses, you mm -hmm. have like this wall through that goes through all the mountain. So you can really, you can even follow your kids doing the harness thing. Mm -hmm. The parents can just follow them along the track, like uh, two, three meters below them. It's really fun. And the cool thing about it, it's some of the obstacles are actually challenging. Uh, not because you have to be like a, an athlete to do it, but it will challenge your fears, maybe your fears of heights or stuff like yeah. that. Um, and if you don't want to, if you're too afraid, if you just don't want to, uh, to, to, to go through the, uh, obstac obstacles, mm -hmm. uh, one of the three passes always has a, a, a easier way to cross the the pass. Sorry about my English. No, it's fine. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. So, since there's three paths on um, each course, one of them bypasses any uh, <laughs> any heights or you know really discomforting kind of things that you don't yeah. want to do or. So so you could still see it, but not be like hanging off Absolutely, and yes. crossing something really yeah. uh, flimsy that's like 20 feet in the air. And it's a genius idea because uh, you can see families from all ages. I really mean all ages. I've seen a grandma grandmother mm -hmm. taking the challenge trails. So <laughs> it's it's so cool. Really, it's so once again, you know, it's what Disney does best. They wait uh until they you until they know how to use the technology properly mm -hmm. uh because i was really surprised that disney was the first theme park operator of this scale that come up with rope courses because i don't know you could think that the capacity of this type of activity can be very low yeah but Disney do, did it first, and that's the most surprising thing to me. Yeah, there's a similar uh, version of this at Animal Kingdom, but it's an upcharge attraction. Um, and it's like, right. yeah, so this is interesting that it's just, it's part of the normal park admission. But it sounds, yeah. like, it sounds like they have the capacity down, though, because they have multiple tracks on three different courses. Uh, uh, in Shanghai. Yeah, in Shanghai, that's what I meant, sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's right, yes. So that's really cool. So yeah, it it really was one of my greatest highlights of this visit. As surprising as it may sound, Challenge Trail is the best. Nice. Maybe, well, maybe not a, not like Tron or Pirates of the Caribbean, <laughs> but in a very different way. I mean, it's not like a ride system. You're not you're not into a vehicle, so you have like this great sense of danger and bravery and it's very different because all of these rides you know that it's safe you know that nothing bad can happen well on the ch challenge challenge trails mm -hmm. well nothing bad can happen but you have this feeling of danger that's it's more prominent yeah it's w w when i tell people i'm scared of heights 
They're like, but you like roller coasters. And I'm like, yeah, I like roller coasters because I'm sitting down in this vehicle with lap restraints and I trust engineering. I don't trust my own legs. Yeah. But now <laughs> here you are and you're walking and you have to do these things. And that's that adds a new level of thrill. And also it's, it sounds incredibly unique. It is. The, the theming is, uh, well, uh, as I was telling, it's on par with the most beautiful uh, uh, level of uh, uh, theming achievement that you can find in Animal Kingdom or mm-hmm. Disney in Paris. It's beautiful, beautiful. Super cool. That's awesome. Uh, so let's go to Soren next because this is kind of available everyone out everywhere else. But the theming is a little different, and the story seems a little insane. If you picked up on the story, <laughs> I don't know if you did or not. Yeah, I'm not sure I did, <laughs> but uh, the, I think from what I got, so there is like this ink legend mm-hmm. uh, of a thunderbird that can make people fly and that's basically everything i got from here yeah the story, the story yeah that's that's kind of what i picked um, up too yeah but uh so it's basically the only story and attraction that disney created that includes actual theming mm-hmm. and it's really really beautiful and you can tell that they needed to f- find a way to create, to have some theming uh, in, mm. I wouldn't say on the cheap, but, you know, uh, having, a, they, 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 I guess they wanted to have a queue line that looks immersive, mm-hmm. but uh, in an affordable way, because I think that uh, Soaring and the Seven Rides, mine, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, was the two attractions that have been added on the roadster lately during development phase. Yeah. So, but you you, you can you you can tell actually the the queue line is really gorgeous. It's a little uh, always the same. Like it's just walls, mm-hmm. and at some point you have the this like uh, uh, it's like a, the, uh, the sky is projected on the siding of a wedding area. Yeah, it looks like and galaxies and stuff. Yeah, and and uh, here and there you can spot some animals constellation, animal constellation appearing yeah. quietly in the sky. So, well, uh, because I've used fast passes on soaring, I didn't had the chance to uh, experience the queue line and spend a lot of time in that space. And thank God I haven't, because the line can be very, very long, just like in the U.S. parks. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think they did it just right. The 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 the, the rock work is amazing, uh, and finally on Sorin you you have a storyline, and uh, yeah, that's a great addition. Awesome! That sounds really really cool. Um... So then the next one is uh, Roaring Rapids. Uh, this is the, it, it's sort of like a Grizzly River Run at California Adventure, but a uh, different theme and also has that giant uh, audio animatronic alligator thing in it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so uh, once again, just like the exploration, the just like the, um, sorry, the um, Camp Discovery Challenge Trail, mm-hmm. it's the same uh, explorer theme so you will find some antique props and stuff in the queue line as well so which which is really cool um, and then I think that the ride layout of the river is the same that in California uh, yeah or at least it's very close um, so I was very surprised because at some part during some parts of the the ride uh, the boats and the yeah it's really wild yeah i didn't expect to be that to, to expect it to be that fast and that wild mm-hmm. uh, so it was really nice but uh once we went inside of the mountain uh i think there was like, like a technical issue because it was really really dark i can't remember of any lighting system or very slight lighting system so i'm not sure i've experienced this uh, properly in the way that the Disney Imagineering, the Disney Imagineers intended it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so uh, the um, audio animatronic is very large, is very smooth, mm-hmm. but uh, I didn't see in the proper way. So I wouldn't talk too much about it because okay. I'm not sure. 
Um, but the overall, the scenery of the the, the rock work and the uh, queue line, uh, it's beautiful. The queue line has a lot of switchbacks, so that's a down sign to me. But overall, it's beautiful. Uh, the only weird thing is that from the outside of the attraction, you don't have a lot of point of view to uh, appreciate the great scenery because the ride is really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, from the outside, you won't see a lot of it. So it's a bit frustrating because I love the water rides. I love watching water rides. And from that point of view, it was a bit frustrating and a bit strange as well because they invest so much money to make it beautiful. But you will only really enjoy it if you are inside of the ride, not really from huh. the outside. Yeah, th yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, anything else you want to cover in Adventure Isle or the attractions around Shanghai? Well, um, at this point, well, uh, I visit the park like it was... Well, it was literally uh, one day after opening day, so mm -hmm. you can definitely feel that the park is still in test and adjust phase. Yeah. So you should expect a lot of uh, break, breakdowns, uh, and yeah, a lot of long lines as well, because the rides like Tron or uh, the Rowing Rapids had to be closed for one and. Day, one entire day, mm -hmm. and when they were running, the trains were really slow. Uh, some trains from Toron had to be removed from the track. Yeah. Uh, more than two hours when pirates had just like 10 minutes. So, you know, when there's such a gap, you can definitely feel that it's not just like an attraction, it's more popular than another. It's, it's really the operation that is that has some issues. Yeah, the capacity uh, and all that I, stuff. Yeah. But overall, um, it really expected my, uh, exceeded my expectations. Uh, the cool. The park. Uh, yeah. Uh, I know there was like a lot of, I wouldn't say a bad buzz, but a lot of suspicion about this project coming from us uh, Disney park fans from mm -hmm. overseas. Uh, be, uh, I think that there was a bit of jealousy. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I know that I had the chance to go to Shanghai and visit it, so it's easy for me to, to say that, guys, it's not a big deal. But mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. Uh, many people thought that this park was going to be wrong for all the reason they can possibly imagine and when I was in the park I was like no this is really a great park and from them one they have such a nice roster of outstanding attractions mm -hmm. you may think that the Roaring Rapids is just a, uh, uh, a typical raft ride but you know it's Disney so they plussed it with an animatronic and it's the same on many attractions um, and even for the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, uh, you guys in the US know it now, so it may not sound new to you, but it's still a very impressive take on, it, on what is basically a skinny counter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you think of all of that, Shanghai Disneyland is really a masterpiece of a theme park, and I I can't believe that it's going to be a failure like Disney in Paris has been struggling for years. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's it's really a great addition to the, the Disney Park family. Yeah. So um, there's a few questions uh, people have. Uh, one is um, from Tom Stidman. He asks, uh, how are the locals uh, been reacting? Are people treating it better than during soft opening? So I guess his thought was, you know, there was the stuff about people trashing the park or whatnot. And also... Uh, worries um about just you know how the park is i guess okay so this is a, a topic that, that that i addressed in my review mm -hmm. uh, because i think that uh we take for granted here in here overseas that chinese behaves very badly uh, uh, and it's true that there are some very different culture habits that uh, are between, uh, for say, the U.S. and China. But uh, from what I saw inside of the Disneyland Park in Shanghai, 
Um, the only thing that I could say was was uh, bad guest behavior is where it was like two women fist fighting <laughs> in the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> They were fist fighting because one of them was like um, uh, jumping the whole line uh -huh. to reach her family, which is actually quite common uh, in the Shanghai Park. Interesting. So, that's that's still pretty funny, though. <laughs> yeah, but you know, uh, I think that uh, the habit from the European guests mm -hmm. from Disney in Paris were not. It was really similar to what I've seen in Shanghai Disneyland so when I compare to the US it's true that people behave uh, better I would say in the US mm -hmm. but, but uh, it's maybe it's my European uh, citizen perspective that's uh, telling me that it wasn't that bad in Shanghai yeah but, uh, I don't know. You didn't uh, see like trash piles everywhere and you know people pooping no, in bushes or no, anything no. like that. Yeah. So well, I know that these pictures appeared on the internet, so I'm definitely not saying that these pictures have been made up, but what I can say is that um cleaning teams are everywhere in the park and uh I have seen well, I visited the park like for 3 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, during these 3 days, I uh, what I've seen online on this picture, so it should, it, it has happened, definitely. But uh, I think that they made a lot of effort to make sure that the trashes uh, don't stay too long on the ground. And it was the same with people peeing and pooing here. Yeah. There <laughs> the, so, oh, I've seen that they added like temporary bathrooms here and there. Uh, near the metro station area, mm -hmm. so I think that they they are they are doing a lot of work to address these concerns be before they in increase too badly. I yeah. know also that the um, Shanghai government uh, released like a uh, guide of conduct something <laughs> for people who want to visit Shanghai Disneyland. Yeah. Uh, so I I think that you would see. Uh, things in the streets when you visit uh, downtown Shanghai or mainland China, mm -hmm. you would see things that you that you wouldn't see visiting Shanghai Disneyland because they, they are doing a lot of work to avoid it to happen. For say, I was in Beijing like two years ago, mm -hmm. and I saw a lady pooing like in f uh, at a bus stop full of people. So I was like, it was. A very strange moment in my life. Yeah. <laughs> very. Yes. But definitely, uh, I haven't seen any of that in Shanghai. And yeah, they're doing a lot of work to prevent it. And I should say that uh, the guests from Shanghai respect a lot more the non-smoking policy than the people in France. So, you know, okay. this, it's not that bad. Okay, cool. Um. I guess we need to wrap it up. I just got a text from my sister. She's going to be here in about 20 minutes, so I want to wrap right. this up. <laughs> we're doing a marathon of uh, Disney Channel uh, movies with her boyfriend, oh, and we're making okay. pizzas. So we're going to have a good evening. You know, chill, have a good time. So, Enjoy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, where can we find you online at? So you can follow me on Twitter at Pokorama. So yeah. Uh, I'm not going to spell it because I'm very bad at this. Yeah, it's P A R. Yeah, P A R C O R A M A. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. And, <laughs> so I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm uh, on my blog, of course, where we can, you can read my review of Shanghai Disneyland and mm -hmm. also a lot of reviews of mainly European rides and uh, uh, big theme parks from the US on uh, my blog so it's leparkorama.com it's like yes. written in French but it's uh, the posts are in English so don't worry about yeah, it yeah <laughs> yeah you don't need a translator <laughs> for it you're okay yeah I really enjoyed your uh, top 20 um, dark ride uh, article and I also enjoyed all your uh, articles about uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter so th oh, thank you yeah thank you uh, for joining us uh, thank you for uh, talking to me for like two hours now <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, have a good one. Um, and everybody, uh, leave us, you, oh, 
before I forget, uh, you guys can follow all of us at Parkscope. Um, go to Parkscope.net. I'll include links uh, to Guillaume's site and all of his uh, profiles. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Kongaloosh. <laughs>